Dames en heren, het is half zeven. Laten we geen tijd meer verliezen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not waste no more time. Please welcome the Roy Hargrove Quintet. In de Sir Studios Artje Manhattan vinden de repetities plaats voor een groot jazzconcert in Carnegie Hall. Talloze corifeeën geven acte de plezance. Oude jazzcats staan broederlijk naast de vele jonge leeuwen. Een van de jonge sterren is de 27-jarige trompetist Roy Hargrove. De gerenommeerde namen kijken niet meer van hem op. Dat was tien jaar geleden anders. Toen, in 1987, stond een schuchtere jonge trompetist van 17 jaar, klein van stuk, aan de zijkant van het podium op het North Sea Jazz Festival. Hij wachtte op zijn speelbeurt. Beroemde muzikanten vroegen zich af waarom de organisatie zo'n jochie had geëngageerd. Tot hij begon te spelen. Iedereen stond versteld van de volwassenheid van zijn spel. Sindsdien is Roy Hargrove bijna onafgebroken op tournee langs de wereldpodia. Ook zijn schaarse vrije dagen thuis in New York zijn gevuld met repetities, clubconcerten, studiosessies, tv-shows, publiciteitswerk. You came out great. So everything's going good, huh? You're on this on Thursday as you're rehearsing over, basically. Yeah, I can go. Yeah, you can lead your life. No, I, well, I. concept that uh, he would make you, you, you could swing really without yeah, doing nothing yeah. with Thelonious. And I found like when I started playing with, with, with Dad, it was like, I said, oh, this is what Frankie Dunlop and Art and Max and all these cats experienced. I see why all of a sudden the way their swing, you know, if you experience playing Thelonious music with Monk and then without him at the piano, and you can have the best cats in the world, you really find out that there was something internal inside him that was, that was unbelievable, you know, and I said, it was, it was almost like a I was born in Waco. I spent the first, like, uh, seven, eight years 
in a little town outside of Waco called Mark, Texas. That's where most of my relatives are now. My grandmother and my aunts and uncles are down there. Most of the people that are in my generation, you know, they, they were involved in all kinds of other things, getting in trouble, you know, but like it was a blessing for me to be able to, to get involved with music because it, it kept me away from those things. He was my first grandson, my first grandchild. That's he and his mother. Mm -hmm. That's him. That's him. Mm -hmm. That's Roy, him being my first grandson, and we've had a lot of pictures of him. I've got a lot of recollections of Roy when he was running around here in the, in the yard just playing. He'd climb up in my trees. I said, Tony, don't climb up in my trees. I called him Tony all the time because his name's Roy Anthony. And I said, I'm not going to call you Roy like I do, do your daddy. I'm going to call you Tony. <laughs> but he didn't like uh, only jazz music. He liked Western, swing. He liked all kinds of music, but that was Roy. Well, I'm so proud of him, I tell you. It's so seldom that you get a, a, a young child like that and uh, go on and, and make a name for himself. I played a cornet first, and I was about nine years old. That's when I started. But it, it wasn't until I actually saw our school band perform when I made the decision that I wanted to be, you know, in the band. It was a little frustrating at first because I couldn't really get a good sound, you know, uh, the first time I started. Then after, uh, after a while, I guess, Getting embarrassed a couple of times made me want to uh, um, practice and really learn how to get a sound. You know? Later on, when I got a little taller, I switched to trumpet. Yeah, well, I, I joined the band in elementary school, and it was a very special kind of situation because um, they were very young uh, kids learning how to improvise, and this is what inspired me to want to join, you know, because I wanted to learn how to do that, you know, take a solo, you know, stand up and play something that was from me. I started Tony out in elementary school. You know, we worked through elementary and middle school and also through high school because, like, uh, uh, well, that's how he got his first start, you know. Um, my uh, lead trumpet player at that time in the little jazz ensemble was uh, ill, and we had a performance or something. Anyway, we were doing something after school, 
and uh, the solo spot had come up, and Raw held up his hand. I said, Mr. Hill, Mr. I, I can play it, I can play it. I said, oh, Tony, you can't play that solo. Yes, I can, yes, I can. He stood up and, and blew us all away, you know. And that's, uh, you know, that's like, you know, he really loves to stand up and play, and uh, uh, we've had some real good experiences together, you know. And then I guess when I got into high school, I went to a performing arts high school in Dallas that was, at the time, it was called the Arts Magnet High School at Booker T. Washington, and that's where, um, they had like all the different areas of the arts, you know, you had music and dance, drama, visual art. And uh, I was, of course, in the music program and they had uh, all these different areas. The music part of it was the biggest part because there was so much, you know, they had the classical groups and they had the jazz groups and they had the guitar ensemble, the chamber, brass ensemble, and they had the wind ensemble. There were so many things that you could, you know, be involved in. And uh, so I was a member of the, uh, the wind ensemble in the, the uh, stage band, the big band, and the uh, combo. A two, a one, two, three, and... <laughs> Let's talk about it for just a second, okay? All right, and then we're gonna have another pianist join us. But the first thing, uh, let's work backwards, all right? You gotta be watching the leader all the time. You thought we're going to the second chorus, right? Okay, I went head, head, and then I talked about, silently I went one time. So with all that in mind, let's bring up another pianist and try it again. Here we go. North. One, a two. Oh, one, two, F, yeah. Roy came here when he was 14. He left when he was 18. He had some problems as a junior in his third year at the school. And he took hold of that. And he was weak in academics at the time. And he just tied his bootstraps uh, really uh, tight and became a leader, both academically and musically, in the school. And is a real inspiration for other students at that time. So, wonderful, wonderful young man. And I think, uh, I think this is where Roy put most of his footsteps. You'll see that he's left a tremendous impression here, both in picture, he's pictured in many of the pictures on the wall. When students come in here, I explain to them that they have had greatness uh, live here and walk here. And uh, Roy's seat was right here. This is, uh, this is Roy's seat. <laughs> As a matter of fact, that's probably the same chair he sat in. And I think of him every day. Uh, he's been a tremendous uh, plus and inspiration in my life. Uh, then as we shoot around this way, you'll see uh, 86 Downbeat Magazine Awards. This is more than any school in North America has won, both on the university and uh, high school or middle school level. We're very proud of that, and Roy was a big part of that. In the beginning, I would play when Roy was in class. Uh, there was no reason to play in his senior year. Uh, I did a little bit, but I knew my place. Uh, Roy was already recording for Blue Note with Don Sickler uh, in New York, flying out on weekends um, his senior year. And uh, when you're amongst genius, you take your place and you know where and what to do. I saw Roy the first time at a performing arts center uh, called Caravan of Dreams. I was there doing some shows with Wynton Marsalis. And um, we came in the night before. Uh, we were gonna do a, an entire week, I think, Tuesday through Sunday. 
Tuesday morning, went and telephoned the, the arts and uh, music high school in Dallas uh, and asked if he could come over and do an impromptu clinic for the kids, and which is something Winton does whenever he can. And Roy was a junior in high school at that time, and so when our jazz band performed, uh, I noticed Winton looking and noticing the young man who was, who was doing all kinds of things on the trumpet. Uh, Winton was cued to come in on the first solo with the big band, and Roy jumped in. So Winton said, uh, okay, go ahead, show me. And he did. After the, uh, the program was over, um, he met Roy, and he took Roy down to the, uh, one of our music rooms and, and just sort of played around with him and talked with him and interviewed with him and said, let's see you do this. And so anytime he asked Roy to do something uh, musically, Roy could do it. When he came back, to the hotel in Fort Worth that afternoon, he told me that he'd heard a little kid trumpet player over there who was tremendous. And uh, it was Roy Hargrove, who was a student at the high school and playing in the school band. And I said, well, why don't you have him come over and sit in? And he said, oh, he's coming. Well, this was on a Tuesday. and. Uh, Although we had repeated reports that he was coming that night, he didn't come until Sunday night. It took him six days to, to finally get there. And so Roy, uh, I said, can you, can you make the trip? And he said, I don't know, I don't have any transportation. So I said, well, call me back. So he finally called back and said he didn't have any transportation over to uh, Fort Worth for the Sunday afternoon. So I said, that's okay, my wife and I will take you. So my wife and I went and picked him up, he and a friend of his. Uh, went and picked him up, picked the two of the boys, the two young men up, and then took them to, uh, over to uh, Caravan of Dreams that Sunday afternoon. But finally he came and uh, he, he went up on the stage and very, you know, shy young man at, at the time and, and went and called him up there and he went from a little boy to and after he played the th first three or four notes, I, was, I said, oh, I see exactly what Wynton was talking about because it was very clear that this was an exceptional musician. And later that summer, uh, Roy was taken to Holland on tour with, uh, with Wynton and his group. And I think that was the break that um, opened the floodgate for Roy. <laughs> Vanaf dat internationale debuut in 1987 stijgt zijn ster als een komeet. Hij wordt de volgende belangrijke stem op trompet genoemd. Een paar jaar later is Roy's naam definitief gevestigd en kan hij zich technisch meten met de grootste trompetisten uit de jazzgeschiedenis. Hij toont een stilistische voorkeur voor de jazz van vroeger, wat hem naast lof ook kritiek oplevert. Hij wordt beurtelings imitator, trendsetter en neobopper genoemd. Hij vormt al snel een eigen quintet, wordt uitgenodigd om het grote als Sonny Rollins en Dizzy Gillespie te spelen en gaat cd's opnemen. Ook legt hij zich toe op het componeren van eigen stukken. I've done some writing. And um, most of everything that I've written, the band has played. I mean, that's the one thing. I don't just play my own tunes. Um, I try to, to incorporate uh, other people's music in the book as well. Because, I mean, one thing that I could say, just being a working musician, you have to know the great American songbook. You have to know how to play some standards. Uh, uh, people are familiar with standards, you know, that's the one reason why I like to play ballads, you know, because people can recognize the songs that I'm playing.
to ten. Yeah. Little Gerald, man. My son. His son. Oh, yeah. My daughter is eight weeks today. Yeah. Uh, Looking at her toes and stuff. Yeah, you know. Well, you have the cast the directors and you have like the cameraman, all that shit is like about timing and <laughs> Levels down. It's about to feed back again. Down. Stop. I can't. Is it showtime? Yeah, I gotta fix my schedule. Is it time? <clears throat> We're ready. If you're yeah. ready. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This day and age, where we are now in the music, it's, it's hard to have your own identity because, I mean, all we really have is recordings. You know, uh, we, I never saw Charlie Parker play live or Coltrane or, or, or Clifford or any of those cats because that was before I was born. So, I mean, all I have really to go by are the recordings. And in, in the music world today, everything is like uh, retro sort of a, a celebration of, of the past, 
you know, what's what's happened before, you know. So you get a lot of cats who sound like other people, you know. You got a cat that sounds like, oh, he sounds just like Clifford, or he sounds just like Lee Morgan, or he sounds just like Freddie, or whatever. Jazz critics who say, uh, uh, oh, well, yeah, the young cats, oh, they're not doing anything new. They just sound like the old cats. But I mean, in, in reality, to me, it's a beautiful thing because in a time where there are people who are on top of, of the music world as far as just like being famous and, 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 and you know, having all of this money and, and having, you know, their own record labels, a lot of them don't know anything about music at all. They know what sounds good to them. You know, but in a time when you have that going on, it's it's beautiful when you can look at it, see a young person that studies the music of John Coltrane or Charlie Parker or Freddie Hubbard or Miles Davis or, or Clifford Brown. You know, because um, these are the people that uh, uh, you know are the foundation for for all of the things that are happening in, in music now. You know, this is the foundation. I mean, their music is timeless. You know. No, 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 85% of the year. So, you know, I, I may be out for three weeks and then I'll come home for a couple of days, go out again for a week or two, and then I'm home for a couple of days. You know, it's just like that. When I come back home, I just sleep. Or, you know, if, if I have a little bit of time, which I don't, <laughs> I might go to a movie or something. But, uh, most of the time, I just try to catch up on the, the rest that I didn't get when I was traveling. So This week, I'll be working Bradley's. And that gig goes to like 3, 4 in the morning. So it's back to the uh, vampire life, so to speak. <laughs> For I am Count Dracula. Everybody knows that there's more uh, appreciation for jazz in places other than the United States. Um, I guess because uh, it's it's imported, or because it's uh, it's always appreciated abroad more than it is here, where it was created. I guess most of the work that I do is in Europe and in, in Japan and other places. You're 
You ever said um, Northeast Jazz Festival is very important for me? Well, I mean, that, that was sort of the beginning for me. And I've been going there every year since then, so that's why I call it my home. I mean, there was like so many different groups that were performing, you know. And I remember one thing stood out that I saw Dizzy Gillespie's big band performing. And each one of those cats played, you know, up there, like in the dog calling notes. And I was just like sitting there like, wow. And then Dizzy came to me after. He's like, you hear them trumpets, boy? I said, yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Enthousiaste bijval. In zalen, op festivals, in clubs. Het publiek draagt Roy Hargrove op handen. Succes lijkt verzekerd, maar is tegelijkertijd een risico. Het risico van stilstand. De sterstatus moet worden gehandhaafd, maar wel met nieuwe ontwikkelingen. Roy's ambitie overstijgt de quintetbezetting. Een big band is zijn grote droom. So I'm have to put together this uh... Who is for the big band? Yeah. Eating right here. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, since the piano chair is open now, we had to start there. Yeah. Um, I dig Alan, man. Yeah, well, I don't see any reason not to. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think he's going to become available. Yeah. Um, There's another cat named Roger Jones. Right. Trumpets. I think we might have to disinclude uh, a crazy man. <laughs> he wasn't bad, you know. He was just trying too hard. Yeah. He was, he was actually, he was, he can play, but yeah. he was, he got a little bit lost in the competition with Riley Mullins. They, they hate him. <laughs> I'm serious. All them cats, they were just like, what'd you get him for? I, I, I think. He is a disrupting factor. Yeah, he's, yeah. I mean, he's like too full of himself. Knew we had this in the cat on. Huh? <laughs> Knew we had this in the cat on. <laughs> on film, man. <laughs> so we got Riley. Riley, Russell, Dante. I'm going to stick with that for a while. 
I mean, any of these cats um, will do it if they have, you know, the availability. No, I've, I've called Byron Stripling, I think, every time we've put the band together. That's one of the first things I can remember, asking Roy years ago. When we first started, I was like, well, what do you really want? A big band, a big band. <laughs> why? why? And I think that the big band is really a significant thing. It's not just a, oh, well, let's do a big band. No, no one casually does a big band. There's no way to casually do a big band. It's an enormous undertaking, and, and all the odds are stacked against you. It's one of the reasons why there are not a lot of big bands working anymore. The finances of it are a nightmare. But the fact of the matter is that given Roy's talent, and given what he hears, and given what he can do, He's the man for the big band. There's nobody else that I know of his generation that be, can begin to stand in front of a big band, conduct it in a way that he does, with the passion that he does, sing, write the music, do the charts, and, and love it. That, it. There's some real sense in which that is his instrument, that big band. It's very challenging.
Roy Harkel, Queen Tech. I think the uh, great alto saxophonist Gary Bartz once said that a uh, jazz musician is like a, a, a fine wine, it gets better with age. You know, the more experience that you have, you know, the more that you develop your own sound. It doesn't come right away, you know. So some cats, you know, they, it takes, takes years, you know, just experience, you know. NTR, speciaal voor iedereen.